Hey, well, again, welcome. I think you should all see what I see now. It's the, it's the first slide uh, from Nations. Uh, so we'll talk about today soil health from a forest land use perspective. So this is a thematic event within the umbrella of Nations. Uh, uh, so welcome. Uh, so our agenda for today is first a little welcome and introduction of, of the theme and to the nation's program. Uh, this is this will be run by uh, myself. I'm I'm Jalma Laudon, uh, together with Johan Steendal at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences or SLU. Then we'll have a keynote speech uh, about soil health and forest climate change mitigation potential from Raisa Meikipe uh, from the Natural Resource Institute in Finland. Uh, after that, we will have a panel discussion uh, where we've invited the three prominent guests uh, from uh, thinking about this. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, Lisa Pietola from the Finnish Innovation Fund, etc. Uh, is uh, Jose, Jose Ramon Olereta from University in Spain. It, and it's Raisa Mekipe from, from uh, Natural Resource Institute. Uh, that will follow by uh, breakout room discussions uh, where you're invited uh, to uh, participate and uh, share your thoughts about soil health issues from a land use perspective. Uh, and then we'll have a, a wrap up uh, after that. And, and this will all be followed by what we call a matchmaking session uh, where for those that are interested uh, can have their opportunity to talk about uh, their ideas from, from about soil health, and especially about the living labs that we'll come back to uh, and how that could be used as a, as a, as a vehicle to, to think about soil health issues um, in, in forest land. Uh, so the panel again, uh, Lisa Petola, uh, Jose Ramon Lariata, and Raisa Mekipe. So especially welcome to you. Um, this is uh, an, uh, great that we managed to get you here and, and, and talk about these issues. Um, uh, this is the team behind this. It's uh, myself, uh, as you see uh, um, in a purple t-shirt. Uh, and you want stand all uh, at, uh, together with uh, uh, Teishri Tivari and Elin Värm, uh, uh, who without their help, this would not work. And of course, there's a big nations team behind this as well that we also uh, are super um, uh, are thankful for. Uh, 41 countries have signed up for this and over 120 participants. So I think this is this is uh, tells you a little bit about the interest in these questions. Uh, uh, and we'll come back to, I think, wh why this is interesting and uh, and and think more about this. Uh, Yuan. OK. So I will continue. Uh, so we're here today to talk about uh, soil health, healthy soil. Uh, and um, well, healthy soils is really key for uh, life on earth, so to say. I mean, in providing fuel, uh, food, fuel and fiber uh, and um, uh, supply our ecosystems, uh, the soil is key and soil health is key. And as you see in this slide, the soil is, is an important factor in um, uh, within many of these sustainable development goals uh, in order to achieve them. Uh, and um, you can change slide. Uh, soil is also uh, one of five missions within the US, you perhaps know, and the, the soil mission has uh, eight objectives regarding soil, and these are objectives that, that should be achieved um, in order to, to have healthy soils. And it, it focuses on, as you see here, reduce, reduce the certification, uh, organic carbon, uh, so soil sealing, soil pollutants, erosion prevention, uh, soil structure and biodiversity, and global footprint of soil, and, and also improve literacy uh, and the knowledge about soils in society. Um, and uh, one uh, 
um, so it's the one tool or one uh, thing in order to achieve this um, that is um, to um, to to work with a concept called living labs you can change a slide here it's and um, uh, this project that we are working in uh, and we we who are organizing this event is called nations and um, uh, it, it has uh, the aim to support the soil mission in promoting the formation of, of such living labs. And the goal is to achieve a hundred of these. And uh, this uh, we do by, by um, national events uh, that are in general presenting living labs and the concept and also thematic events like this, where we have more focused activities and discussions and matchmaking. We have 14 partners in this program. program. Uh, last fall, there was uh, an open call for Lemon Labs, and there will be yet another call for Lemon Labs later this year. So, uh, briefly, what, what this Lemon Labs concept is all about, if you change the slide, um, the, it is um, um, it's like, it's like experimental landscape or work that you carry out in, in real environments. Uh, where you have iterative feedback from, uh, for example, soil management uh, practices, uh, which are implemented and evaluated. And this is done in collaboration between practitioners, policymakers, and uh, researchers. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of a co-creation uh, concept, um, which uh, should be uh, also applied in different uh, places in different countries and in different parts of the landscape. Lighthouses are, so to say, part of this. And we can actually go to the next slide where uh, it's illustrated a little bit more. Um, the Living Lab is, is the number of sites which together uh, target uh, specific questions regarding the soil management. Uh, and yeah, it is uh, both on the regional and um, uh, nationals between uh, international scale uh, and uh, within this you have sites which in some cases also can be called lighthouses or uh, demonstration uh, examples of, of specific for example management practices um, so this process of um, organizing or forming these living labs is, is, is ongoing and uh, as I mentioned, there are these calls that has been um, carried out, and some of these have gotten accepted. Um, and if you change to the next slide, there is also a more, more informal um, way of um, um, organizing these living labs or reporting these living labs um, initiatives. And in a project called PrepSol, which is it's like a sister project to nations, uh, this is being done, and there, there, there are maps. There is a map here uh, where living labs um, um, are, are being um, reported, and you you can go here and see um, some of these living labs. I mean, they are they are more uh, informal and can be uh, are, are probably um, um, objects for for these uh, applications for for formal uh, financial support of these living labs. Okay, Yalma, I leave the word to you and you can uh, continue describing a little bit more in detail what uh, such a living lab, how they can, it can look and... Right, um, right. And, yeah, and in I particular did... in the forest con context. Right, yes. So thank you, Yuan. Um, so, so just one very quick uh, aspect of this soil health issue though I think it's important for us to 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 remember and I think most of the people that participating here are probably from a forest perspective uh, but but soil health issues uh, are often thought of in a land in an agricultural perspective and that's a little different from our forest perspective and and why is that well uh one major difference is, of course, the history of the land. Uh, agricultural land is is it has moved out over into an anthropogenic um, uh, use, uh, while forests um, are often natural or semi-natural uh, uh, in many ways. 
But the rotation period is also very different. I mean, most crops are, are harvested every year, whereas in a forest perspective, it could be 50 to 100 years in a rotation period. Uh, that also means that the, the use of heavy machinery is uh, several times per year in agricultural systems, whereas maybe every, once every second day, decade in, in forestry. Fertilizers are, and, and pesticides are, are commonly used in agricultural systems are very seldom or ever never used in agricultural systems. So there, there's quite a large difference between this, these systems. And it's, of course, very important to remember that when we think about soil health in a forest perspective. Uh, we did a, 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 had a national engagement event on 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 the potential soil health issues in forestry in in Sweden, and we came up with some aspects that are, are quite interesting and, and important to consider when it comes to put soil health issues uh, regionally in in a Swedish context. and And you could read those here. And just soil scarification, of course, is one that we share with agricultural systems. Soil biodiversity losses, organic matter content, drought and water shortages uh, are <clears throat> nutrient leakages and, and are, are, are those aspects that are, are common to agricultural systems. But uh, one aspect that is now more and more coming into, into to play is uh, peatland drainage and rewetting, and especially the rewetting phase, which is something that is discussed a lot in, in the European context, is, is coming up on the agenda. Forest fires is another one of those, of course, related to drought and water shortage. Um, that is, is something that also up there and on high on the, on the forest agenda, especially in, 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 in some regions. Now, we'll hear more about that later. So, <clears throat> When it comes to this uh, living lab aspect, uh, we have been working with a, a context uh, or, or a living lab in in a in a Swedish context uh, up in in the northern part of Sweden in a, what's called a biosphere region. Uh, it, it's that is uh, funded by UNESCO. Uh, uh, and and this is an area that goes all the way from the from the mountain area and the the border to Norway. Uh, uh, and through the forest biome and down to the the, the coast and and the urban and agriculture areas. So this really expands through uh, a quite a large area across uh, Sweden. Uh, if you take the car, it takes five hours to drive from from one end to the other end, uh, or from <clears throat> north to south here. Um, and I will focus on the forested part here. Uh, and and that is uh, it's called the curriculum catchments uh, study that is uh, th where we work a lot with uh, one of those lighthouses one of those areas of where we have a really strong connection between research and, and other uh, uh, other uh, 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 where we co-create a lot of knowledge together with with different. Uh, Interested parties, every from everything from 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 the Swedish EPA to uh, forest agency to 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 uh, productive forest or industrial companies that work with forest revenues uh, and and timber harvesting. Uh, so everything from uh, policy development to 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 more commercial interest are are things that we work with uh, when it comes to carbon balance, soil biodiversity, water water retention, uh, wetland restoration or, or rewetting, uh, but also other other aspects. So if we just take one of these 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 topics that uh, how we work with this is is. Uh, uh, the curriculum catchment where we use soil moisture as an example, where we are are using our our our, our scientific knowledge to develop better maps uh, uh, that can then be used to to both uh, improve forest planning uh, but also re reduce the impact of vulnerable areas, uh, and then but also can be used to uh, identify carbon stocks. Uh, and this then in turn can be used for, for then improving policy and forest management. Uh, and then go all the way back to, to find financial contribution for, for our continue this work and, and, and more, more detailed and, and larger scales and, and all of those aspects. So this is one example of how we work with the, uh, the living labs and the, and the lighthouses uh, in, 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 a, in a Swedish forestry context. So now comes a question for you. What uh, um, 
that we want you to answer. And that is, uh, what sector do you work in? Uh, so, so you will come up a, a little survey here. You could go in and then you try to answer this. Uh, is it in academia, forest companies, NGOs, government, student, or other? And you answer that, and then you 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 you, you send send or quicker. Uh, So I'll give you a few seconds to answer that, and then we move on to the next question. It's just a way of, for us to see who, who we have here. Oh, 60% in, in academia, great. But NGOs, government, um, and, and forest companies and others. Um, uh, good. Uh, then we move over to the next question. Uh, okay. Uh, I did not. I did not move forward. Well, you could then. Are you working on the living lab or lighthouse with soil health focus in forest land? Uh, you could just give your answer there. Yes, sir. it's a yes or no question, really. Okay, let's see if we get some more questions here. Um, well, a lot of people answered yes, um, so that's good. Um, let's see if we get more, another question. Uh, what barriers need to be overcome to achieve this? Uh, well, if ever, everyone answered yes, but uh, for those that, that did not answer, maybe you were no, uh, you did not work on this. Do you have any? Do you have a short answer? This is might. Um, uh, uh, I will. I will myself write funding here. Uh, And then we should have a last question, I think. Okay, answers first. Funding. 100% uh, wrote funding. Good, and the last question then. Are you interested in preparing consortium for the mission soul call? If you write, yeah, I write yes. Uh, if you are interested, you should definitely stay until the end of our little um, today, because we have this uh, uh, we have this matchmaking session after that. At the end of this 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 uh, uh, event today. 100% yes, say yes, yes. Okay. All right, but I think, Yelmer, we can okay. ask uh, Raisa to um, prepare her keynote speech now and yes, hand the no. floor over to her. Okay, but let me just, before she do, do, do that, uh, I will just, uh, I'm starting to be able to move forward again. Uh, I will just uh, uh, remind you about uh, what we'll after, uh, after our, our our panel discussions, first we'll have uh, Raisa talk about uh, uh, in her sp speech soil health and forest climate change mitigation potential. Uh, after that, we will have a panel discussions, and uh, followed by a network session where we talk about um, uh, in breakout rooms. Uh, and here we have. Um, I just want to tell you a little quickly about the questions that we are dealing with. And so rem remember that and, and then, but we'll come back to this at the end. 
Uh, this will then follow up again by this match matchmaking session. So uh, with that, I just want to, uh, uh, I will uh, stop sharing and then I leave the floor to uh, Raisa. Okay, I hope you see my screen and full screen. Is that right? It's, it's perfect. Okay, right. So my title today, it's, uh, it's shown here. It's about soil health uh, preparation of the EU soil monitoring law and, and some use about uh, forest soil climate change mitigation potential. Uh, it was already uh, well introduced that uh, you have a soil mission and, and today my topic touched a bit about uh, specific objectives of soil, soil mission to six and, and eight. Uh, which are conserve and increase soil carbon stock and then improve soil structure and habitat quality for soil biota and, and then a bit about uh, increased soil literature, literature in uh, society across member states. Uh, uh, EU had the soil uh, strategy for 2030 and has set a vision that by uh, 2050 all EU soil ecosystems are in healthy condition and are, uh, are more resilient. And EU uh, has set the framework to protect and restore soils and ensure that they are used sustainably. And, and part of the EU strategies is preparation of the soil monitoring law, which includes monitoring framework for all soils across Europe and it uh, includes guidance for uh, soil, uh, sustainable soil management and, and component of soil restoration and restoration of con contam contaminated sites. Uh, at the moment, uh, soil monitoring law, which is uh, proposed by EU Commission, is discussed by, by EU Parliament. And, and if you want to see the original uh, version or contribute and, and follow the discussion you can you can do so it's open open process uh, at the same part time when the uh, EU has already proposed the soil monitoring law and uh, including those uh, uh, soil indicators who what can you be used for uh, monitoring soil health there are there are research projects who are developing, and testing potential soil indicators. And one of these projects is Benchmarks, which is uh, building European network for uh, characteris characterization and harmonization of the monitoring approaches. And, and this, uh, this project organized uh, 24 workshops for, for stakeholders in different parts of the Europe. And, and the aim of the workshop was to build trust and partnership with different stakeholder groups uh, to gain insights and knowledge on soil health objectives and practices among stakeholders. And we really collected stakeholders' views what soil health and uh, uh, ecosystem services which are related to soil, what they mean to stakeholders and how stakeholders understand them and what uh, soil related information stakeholders uh, would like to have in the future. So the monitoring system should, should be built on, on, on needs of the uh, stakeholders. Uh, definition for the soil, uh, soil health is that uh, it's the capacity of the soil to function uh, as a living system and to sustain plant and animal production and health and to maintain or enhance uh, water and air quality, and to further provide ecosystem services in sustainable manner. Uh, this is the definition and political def definition is a bit shorter. We don't stop there, but uh, I go to the uh, to some of the analysis what are done concerning proposed soil health uh, criteria, those which are proposed by soil monitoring law. Uh, at, at EU level, assessment of soil health considers salinization, soil erosion, loss of soil organic carbon, and subsoil compaction. And at member states, there are uh, uh, additional 
criteria as which are uh, designed and thresholds are uh, uh, set at the level of the member states. But those which, uh, which might be monitored at European scale, uh, they also have threshold, proposed threshold. Uh, and we evaluated um, one of those, so those criteria and we focused on soil carbon loss criteria. And in soil monitoring law, they propose that uh, uh, criteria for healthy soil is based on soil organic carbon uh, per clay ratio and threshold. Uh, what they propose is one uh, by 13. And we analyzed a bit uh, what, what, does, what does that mean to, to European soil and our manuscript is uh, submitted and it's openly available in, in that website. But uh, a few slides about results. Uh, if we simply ap uh, apply this uh, proposed uh, uh, indicator, uh, this figure illustrates that uh, different land use types, cropland, forest and grassland, uh, they are located in different places in this uh, uh, these dimensions and most of the croplands are considered unhealthy if this criteria is used and majority of the forest uh, uh, sites are considered healthy, healthy. So this doesn't really uh, differentiate how they are managed or what are the conditions, but it's the, uh, it, it separate them just by land use uh, uh, type. And then if we compare this, uh, uh, this criteria and results with the other source of, sources of information for uh, soil carbon loss. We can use the data which is provided by by national forest in uh, national national greenhouse gas inventories, and and submitted to uh, United Frame United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So UNFCCC data uh, was used as a reference, and and here this is a very busy uh, figure, but if we see the results for one country like uh, to uh, Finland, uh, there are three bars. They are for croplands, forests, and grassland. And the color code shows that uh, uh, what is reported by greenhouse gas inventory. And in Finland, greenhouse gas inventory report that uh, soil, forest soil is a carbon sink. And also this indicator confirms or report that uh, majority of the forest soil are, are healthy. So this criteria for carbon, uh, carbon uh, soil, cor soil organic carbon loss indicate that it's, 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 it's healthy. But uh, at the same time, uh, croplands uh, are, are sources of uh, carbon and also this soil health indicator uh, indicates that less than 20 percentage of the croplands in Finland are, are healthy. Uh, this doesn't agree that well in, in all cases like Ireland or, or so, but, uh, but anyhow, this is overall analysis what we have, we have done, done so far. And in the map, we can see that uh, the proportion of the degraded soils is larger in southern Finland in, in dry areas in Mediterranean climate and, and proportion of the healthy soil is uh, in the north. But this might come also uh, uh, from the fact that a majority of the uh, sites are in forests in, in Scandinavia, in, in northern uh, Europe. And according to this criteria, they seem to be healthy. Our conclusion from, <clears throat> from this, uh, this analysis is that it's really challenging to find a single indicator for soil carbon loss, um, other than, than measurements or really repeated uh, measurements and, <clears throat> and, and modeling. Um, so this proposal indicator 
does not work with the single threshold. Uh, if you want to develop an uh, uh, indicator based on this, uh, uh, this ratio, soil organic carbon and clay ratio, we should develop a, a threshold for different soil types and climatic conditions and land use classes uh, separately. And then it wouldn't be a, a single one indicator for all of the uh, year. Um, <clears throat> I go to the uh, climate change mitigation potential of forest and, and forest soil. Um, first, uh, first result what I want to share with you is that we made the review paper. <clears throat> review paper on, um, on effects of uh, forest management on soil carbon and greenhouse gas fluxes, and and this uh, this figure is from policy brief, which uh, was prepared after the uh, review paper, and we summarize by these small arrows that uh, how the um, soil carbon stock and fluxes of CO2, uh, methane, and N2O uh, are affected by different management practices. And for instance, the first first box uh, shows that uh, on upland for soils, uh, upland forest soils, uh, mineral soil forests, uh, nitrogen fertilization increased soil carbon stock and and decreased CO2 emissions and methane emissions. Uh, while if we think about fertilization on peat soils uh, with wood ash, which is commonly applied now. Uh, this uh, practice increase CO2 emissions from the soil in the long, might increase uh, CO2 emissions uh, from soil in the long run. So anyhow, this review paper be, and, and policy brief based on that is, is available, available for, for end users if you are interested in that topic. We also made an overall evaluation what is the forest-based climate change mitigation potential, potential in, uh, in EU uh, 27 plus Norway, Switzerland and UK. And, and here in this figure we summarize uh, what is the potential related to wood use, so substitution and cascading, uh, very minor influence, that's the bottom, bottom part of the figure. And then the most <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, main part of the uh, potential is there in in active management practices and especially peatland management. But this comes with a very high uncertainty, and also forest conserva conservation is option to to enhance uh, forest carbon sequestration. To, so to increase. Uh, <clears throat> forest carbon sinks in in EU and and yeah the peatland man management and peatland restoration has a high potential but it comes with a very un high uncertainty uh, uncertainty and there is only few um, few studies uh, who have focused on on that <clears throat> then in in holy soils um, project B, we also established new experiment and started to measure effects of management practices on on soil uh, on, on on forest soil and this map illustrates where we have uh, our experiment and then I will tell just uh, uh, quickly uh, something about uh, uh, preliminary results what we have from these experiments in in northern uh, Europe, in Finland, we are testing effects of uh, fertilization, including nitrogen fertilization on, on forest soil. We have Scots pine stand, which was fertilized several times. This uh, uh, figure tells that the experiment was started already uh, in 1960s and have been fertilized since then several times. And actually the whole experiment was factorial designed with also other nutrients, not only nitrogen. And, and our experiment confirmed what was known already earlier that nitrogen fer fertilization 
increase soil carbon uh, stock. And over this long period of time, it was increased by 60 percentage, while the increase of tree biomass was also increased, but, but only by 50 percentage. And, and now what we are doing, we are digging deeper and we are analyzing how the uh, these treatments, these uh, fertilized addition of, of different nutrients uh, affect uh, soil microbial uh, communities and functional groups. And we are measuring uh, uh, greenhouse gas fluxes and, and these, these papers are uh, in preparation. We have seen that uh, some functional groups and some enzyme activities are really changed and they might explain this increase. Um, in addition, we, we are concluding that uh, nitrogen fertilization in this nutrient poor, poor side increase everything. It increased tree growth, it increased uh, fungal biomass, it increased uh, biological activity and, and so on. But this is maybe the special case for such nutrient poor ecosystem where uh, nitrogen is heavily limited in initial stage. Now I ask how much time I have or do I have any time? Uh, uh, you have uh, five more minutes. Okay, then I say a couple of words, of words about peatlands and drivers of the <clears throat> peatland, so peatland greenhouse gas uh, fluxes. Um, it is known that uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions on, on peatlands, uh, they are controlled by water table. And there is the global uh, meta-analysis showing how sensitive uh, these emissions are uh, to uh, uh, lowered uh, soil uh, water level. This uh, left-hand side illustrate that uh, that what is a increase in greenhouse uh, gas emissions if you decrease the water table. And on the right-hand side, the figure illustrate that when the water is down there. Uh, maybe in 60, 80 centimeters, we have high CO2 emissions and, and exchange of methane emissions and, and uptake. And if we raise the water table uh, uh, to 30 centimeters, we decrease CO2 emissions and, and still methane emissions are, are, are not uh, increased. So we propose that uh, instead of having uh, uh, well, managed uh, ditch network and, and trained peatland forest, we could elevate water table even on, on, on peatlands where we are aiming to produce uh, timber. Uh, we have measurements and we, we, uh, we have model uh, which uh, uh, confirm that uh, if we have forested peatland living uh, vigorous trees, uh, uh, soil water table uh, will stay under uh, 40 centimeters, which is enough for vigorous uh, growth of uh, roots. So rooting zone is uh, topmost uh, 30 centimeters and it's for trees, it's enough to have water level, level which is below that. It's, it's not necessary to keep that as deep as as in our managed peatland forest, it's uh, it's it's used to be by drainage. And how to maintain this favorable uh, water table, which might decrease emissions? We are proposing that uh, instead of clear cutting, we should apply uh, selection harvesting and continuous cover forestry on those fertile peatlands from where we have very high emissions now. Because uh, this, uh, this figure illustrate that on, on top, uh, top panel, that uh, if we do clear cutting, then we have a very high CO2 and N2 emissions from the site and also methane emissions, emissions from the ditches. And, and it takes a long time to, uh, to get a better balance uh, at ecosystem le level. But if we maintain forest cover and just do selection harvesting and maintain continuous cover, uh, we avoid this 
face of uh, uh, really large emissions. And according to our measurements, uh, after clear felling of uh, fertile peatland site, emissions are as large as uh, from, from croplands on peat soil, so 30 tons of CO2 equivalents per year per hectare. <clears throat> then uh, one more issue about uh, uh, greenhouse gas dynamics of, of the peat. Uh, this paper is published, but I will show only this, uh, this figure from there. Uh, you don't have to read the figure if you just uh, uh, listen what I say. I'm, I'm saying that uh, uh, gas concentrations vary according to peat depth and measurements from different uh, uh, depths indicate that uh, in somewhere in, in uh, 40 centimeters from the surface there is a uh, lowest methane concentrations, which uh, confirm that uh, topmost uh, peat layer consumes both methane from atmosphere and also that methane which is produced in deeper layers. And, and about CO2 emissions, we know that uh, uh, a majority of the uh, emissions are produced in topmost uh, layer. Concentrations are high in the lowest part, but anyhow the uh, flux to the atmosphere originate mo mostly from topmost layer. Uh, then uh, about ditches, we have learned that ditches are the main source of methane emissions, but if we leave ditches and let them, um, yeah, let let them uh, be covered by mosses, methane emissions are almost stopped. So our analysis show that most covered ditches were really negligible methane sources while open uh, most free uh, ditch uh, with running some slightly running water, it's, it's a source. And then I can conclude that now we are working on linkages between peatland greenhouse gas fluxes and microbial processes. And, and as a summary of these, uh, these findings, maybe the two, two points were clear, I don't have to repeat them, but um, then we know that effects of climate virus management practices are not fully accounted in national greenhouse gas inventories. So inventory methods have to be updated and further developed, including this, this uh, effect of uh, bryophytes, mosses on, on ditch emissions. It's not integrated to greenhouse gas emissions at the moment. And, and further measurements are needed, especially soil responses to clear cutting are not well known. Emissions, what we have measured, they are huge, but we need more sites, uh, more variation in condition from where we get the data to confirm how, how large they are and to be able to generalize to how, how large emissions we really have from clear cut. And, and so EU efforts, uh, EU soil mission will really enhance understanding on soil properties and processes. And it also creates nice networks between uh, scientists and uh, between research and stakeholders. So that's, that's very welcome to, to, to us scientists to have more communication with all stakeholders. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Raisa. That was excellent. Uh, uh, so we will move now, move over into uh, 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 the next part of this, which will be a panel discussions. I think but before we do that, we had one quick question uh, that uh, that you might be able to go into the, the chat um, uh, right now and, and ask yeah. uh, and answer directly uh, either now or a little later. But we will <clears throat> we will go into to the question uh, or, or to the panel discussion. Uh, and and uh, so in that I would like to introduce also uh, Lisa Pietola and uh, Jose Ramon Olrieta. And I am. I apologize for both my Finnish and my Spanish pronunciation, uh, uh, which is uh, 
uh, has has uh, there is room for improvement there. Um, so uh, uh, so I do that in advance. Uh, but but let me let me just uh, there we are. Good. I would like to I would like to 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 uh, move over to Jose uh, and and uh, ask about first give give us a little bit about your background uh, and also what you think are the most important soul health health challenges from from your perspective and maybe from a Mediterranean perspective. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a soil scientist and I work at the University of Lleida uh, teaching at the uh, degree, forestry degree, and also master's degree. Um, I work, therefore, I work uh, mostly with forest soils, although I also collaborate with my colleagues working with agricultural soils. Um, for me, the two basic um, problems with uh, soil with soils in forest ecosystems, as far as I know them, and, and that refers mostly to uh, intensive forest plantations in northern Spain and forest soils in this semi-arid region in northeastern Spain, where I where I work, and in the uh, intensively managed forest plantations in northern Spain, the, to me the basic problem in terms of soils is the uh, intense soil erosion produced by the use of heavy machinery after clear felling of these intensive plantations and also the depletion of nutrients in soils as a result of the intensive um, harvesting of, of, of trees in this, in this plantation. Uh, in the semi-arid forests, uh, semi-arid or subhumid forests in northeastern Spain, um, the uh, main problem is related to the possible effects of forest fires. And, but otherwise, as management is very light or non-existent in many circumstances, then really management is not uh, an issue in, in this kind of forests. Okay, we'll come back to you. Uh, we'll move over to Lisa uh, and, and, and ask you the same question. What are, what are a little bit about your background and, and, uh, and, and uh, what you think just quickly, what the, the main questions are from, from your more European wide perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for this kind invitation. I'm very, very pleased to, to be part of this discussion. I'm a soil scientist also, and I have been working at the University of Helsinki and still as a docent there in soil sciences, mainly in agricultural soils. But as a farmer and forest owner, I have been uh, following let's say past many de decades already, how we have managed our forests uh, in Finland and how we already, we are improving. Also, we have, we, uh, we have a, a way to, to go to further improvements like reducing tillage, reduced uh, compaction and, and due to the climate change, we do have also milder winters where we do have then uh, this erosion problem. And so, so we need to keep our soils as a plant covered as possible, like uh, Raisa also greatly uh, showed uh, us um, in his key uh, uh, keynote presentation. And um, for me, uh, what is soil health? It is a capacity of providing ecosystem services. And uh, I think that uh, although there are differences between agricultural sites and forestry sites, all these essential ecosystem services are, are very, very relevant from forest perspective view too. And I would, uh, I would take these um, ecosystem services, like if I list these, the, the, the providing uh, biomass is of course very, very important for our forests and, and uh, also, also berries and mushrooms, etc. And um, the soil, 
uh, host biodiversity. So the biodiversity is very important uh, in context of soil and soil pores and soil structure. And I would like to pick up the soil structure and biodiversity in our EU soil mission targets. We have these eight targets as shown. That would be the most crucial and we really need to take care of soil structure and biodiversity because soil pores, soil structure host, host the, the biological uh, functions in soil and also uh, host or or is essential for infiltration of water and water management is uh, the second very very important issue in this area for me so um, I would uh, like to also say that uh, now we are discussing of living labs today so to understand the soil functions and many, many uh, ecosystem services by forestry. It's really needed for whole society, for land users and landowners and uh, forest industry and all together to solve the problem. So this is my, my job today and, and uh, in, in Citra. And, and this is really important work to, to do all of us. And therefore I'm very pleased to, to be here today. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Raisa, do you have anything to add to, I mean, you you gave a very nice and illustrative uh, mm -hmm. presentation on, on, on your work and some of your, your thinking. Do you want to add something for, for this? Just... Uh, yes, I, I, could add, I could add that um, yeah, scientists, researchers have, have developed lots of decision support systems. Uh, tools which are used by forest managers and and uh, we we provide scenario analysis and 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 yeah tools for decision support and and the uh, trouble is that so far they have been concentrating only on trees so uh, biomass and growth of trees and and what is reported is how how this or that management or thinning or or a climate change or uh, nitrogen deposition or what, whatever, just name it, how that affects trees. And then decision makers know what are uh, responses of uh, uh, growing stock and forest growth on, on various management practices. But soil is not included. In most of the decision support tools, soil is really ignored. And when it comes to issues like forest carbon sequestration, if you don't account soil, uh, you, you don't have a full picture. And we already know that the, when, when trees are, are carbon stink, at the same time, soil might be sore. So if you, if you ignore soil from your analysis, you, you might make decision based on biased view. And I emphasize that it's scientists' task to integrate soil in, into the decision support tools and to provide appropriate, appropriate information for society and decision maker and what, ha what, what happens and what is the importance of soil in, uh, in, in different decisions. Well, thank you, Raisa. I, I, I want to raise that question to, to both Jose and, 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 and Lisa. Do you, do you agree that soils are often ignored uh, in, in, or has been ignored? Uh, I, I, guess, uh, I guess the new EU law and the new soil mission is, is a way of, of, of uh, think, adding and, and, and acknowledging the soils. But what, what do you think from your perspectives? Yeah, yeah. I, if I can continue, yeah, yeah. I feel that uh, soils have been ignored and we really need to understand all these essential ecosystem services and try to improve them so that we really can make most use of our our soils and, and forestry and of, of course uh, for for uh, timber but also for uh, for, for uh, our people uh, to to have this uh, recreational value and all these cultural heritage value and landscape and all this and so so we need to understand that we won't spoil them when we are hiking there in the forest that soil is really sensitive a part of the, the ecosystem and so it's not it is not just a soil so that we should yeah better understand and and uh, appreciate that so yes so this is my view thanks thank you Jose. yes i also fully agree with Raisa. 
and we only have to look at the um, sustainable forest management um, uh, agreements in any country or even in the, the international systems of uh, sustainable forestry where uh, soil uh, characteristics are ignored or are simply stated at a very general scale with no uh, actual um, practical data to, to, to guess or to assess whether um, forests are sustainably managed in terms of soils. But then we should not go to the other end of the scale. And one of my concerns with the uh, soil monitoring law and all the benchmark uh, data that it uh, suggests are, uh, and I think Raisa has uh, clearly stated the issue, is that we cannot uh, give uh, like this kind of uh, benchmark uh, values, say organic carbon to play ratio without considering the whole land use system because if we think in terms of uh, biomass productivity, water harvesting or whatever, we cannot ignore that the soil does not live by itself, that it lives within a higher scale ecosystem because it will, there will always be some kind of vegetation on top of the soil, uh, whether it's just mosses or it's big trees, whatever. So we have to analyze the whole system and not just the soil as a separate entity. Good, well, very good point there. And I, I want to continue on this on this uh, tangent that you are you are talking about now, and 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 ask, what do you think is so? So if soils are often ignored uh, uh, in, in a forest context, do you think there's a difference between uh, how we view the soils in forestry and in the agricultural systems? Hmm. Are, are, are soils more thought of in, in an agricultural cultural yeah. perspective? Yeah, I feel uh, if I can continue, yeah, you're correct. Uh, and maybe because, uh, well, it is more short term perspective. We do have annual or peren perennial crops, but the maximum, let's say, four years old. And so we need also uh, in agriculture to, to produce a biomass within some months. And and uh, for forestry, many decades. So the perspective is so different. And so uh, in agriculture, we really need to take care of the soil fertility. But also, of course, we need to understand that in forest sites, there are nutrient recycling. And we need to uh, make most use of the soil biota and, fun and uh, biological functions to, to recycle nutrients and carbon and so. But but uh, maybe because of the the, the time period is different, uh, and the production time of biomass is maybe that is the primary reason. Would say so. Thank you. Yeah, I I want to add that uh, it's also research activity is different at global scale. There is a huge amount of soil scientists who are working with agricultural soils and, and, and relatively small scientific community who are focusing on forest soil. And yeah, that all, yeah. Good. That, that's just the fact. Yes, I also agree. And I think when we look at, for example, at this uh, um, organic carbon to clay ratio, uh, I don't, I have not been able to find how do you measure that? Down to what soil depth you measure that, for example. And that can be quite simple in an agricultural uh, setting because uh, you don't have organic horizons. But if you are in a forest setting, does that uh, organic carbon to clay ratio also hold for forest? Do you sample in the same way? Do you include the organic horizons in that sample? Don't you, do, you, do you not include them? How do you do that? And I think uh, the the whole system of, of uh, monitoring and the benchmark values uh, suggested there, I think, are very much biased towards agricultural conditions. Uh, I think as Raisa clearly, clearly showed. Good, thank you. So um, I want to switch the topic it up, uh, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah, I just would like to add that, of course, agriculture is about food, and we eat every day. So this is also maybe the one reason that it has been more 
focused uh, the soil science on. Yeah. on we on also go to toilet every day, and this is one of the <laughs> yeah, most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, let me just switch the context a little, a little, uh, uh, a little bit, uh, and that is. Uh, uh, and thinking about living labs, is that a way? Is, is that? Uh, I mean, this is a this is something that uh, the EU has has launched as a as a as a vehicle to to enhance the the uh, soils uh, perspective. Um, uh, do you do you think it's useful? And how would you think about implementing it uh, in your context? Yeah, well, if I can say, yeah, it is really good approach because today people, they don't know so much anymore what is forestry or what is food production. And so we really need to collect people from different uh, sectors, all stakeholders to the site and describe uh, the, the functions of nature with humans to produce biomasses and other ecosystem services to measure them and in that they also, when we collect people there, uh, they can understand that we can together uh, try to find solutions because uh, lack of knowledge is huge. And if there are lack of knowledge, then we cannot uh, make the best solutions to, to have better ecosystem services and, and proof soil health issues um, in forestry or, or agriculture or in urban soils like, like all these on the agenda today for the mission. Mm -hmm. Good. I, I would say that uh, you has launched this living lab and lighthouse concept, but uh, I feel that we have had something like that all the time. So we have uh, established uh, experimental sites or demonstration sites where we do our research and we have uh, uh, for instance, on peat lab side, we have a different uh, thinning practices demonstrated and we are measuring them. And we have had hundreds of visit visitors on, on that side. And our research team collaborate with, uh, with main stakeholders in that region and in, in, in national scale. So uh, as soon as you create such a demonstration site from where you also can can provide uh, scientific results and results how these various management practices perform and affect ecosystem. There are interest from society and stakeholders to visit and to discuss. And it's it's nicer to uh, to have a conversation and discussions when you also can demonstrate and initiate discussion by by seeing something there on the, on the cropland or in the forest. Mm -hmm. So I, I see that we have had that already before EU initiated that, and it's super good if there is further funding for such effort mm -hmm. from national sources and also from EU. Right, but do you think so? Uh, a, a question for you then. Uh, and I, I, I'm aware of this this as well, and and that there this has been an ongoing thing in in many countries. But what mm -hmm. I perhaps one thing you make. Uh, what do you think about the usefulness of of uh, bringing in this in a European context and thinking about different countries and different places, different living labs that are working with same type of questions in other places where you can then compare and use as, as, as into comparison between different sites. Because uh, of course our demonstration sites are commonly only one here and one there, uh, but we have uh, not done enough work, I see, that to compare between countries. Um, and that might be something that, that can be very, very useful in the future. Uh, yeah, Lisa. Yeah, yeah, if I can continue. Yeah, we need different sites because the solutions under different pedoclimatical conditions, they are different. We have different forests and different species and, and soils. And so, of course, we need to, 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 um, to make best policy at EU level. We really need different uh, living labs uh, around Europe. So that because one size fits, does not fit all. Right, Ex excellent. Because and and the, the new, uh, I mean, there are many new laws coming into play. EU laws that are coming into play now, and especially now I'm thinking of the, especially the the restoration law that will 
play in uh, that is now in under discussion that could, could could also enhance, for example, peatland restoration as but one major issues. Well, it might not be useful everywhere, and there might be better solutions in, in some places that might be worth looking at. Uh, Jose, do you want to say something on this living lab aspect? Yeah, I think uh, one uh, I think one interesting ob objective of these living labs should be bringing down to earth the, the these benchmark values suggested by the European Union, which are, to my uh, as far as I see them, they look too broad, too general, and not really useful for practical uh, situations, you know, in specific places. Do you see, so what do you see in these living labs, and if you look in the crystal ball for the future, do you see the science being in, in, the, in, in, the, top, in, in the main frame, or is it the co-creation and the collaboration with, with with stakeholders or what's the main what's where is the main direction here that we need to go or is there a main direction for for me i i think that it's uh if you create them in different parts of the europe and and to various uh ecosystems and land use type and land use types uh it's 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 a way to disseminate results to end users more efficiently than earlier and when we start to do that that leads to co-creation also when we have more context and more communication then we also know what are the needs of the society for further information and that guide also research and 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 i i hope that we can also create uh, more living labs than lighthouses where stakeholders are uh, active active partners now we have a living labs in the forest which are private forests the forest owners are interested in work from the very beginning but still the design of the experiment what we demonstrate it's uh, it's based on on researchers uh, ideas and research plan what we made before stakeholders were heavily involved but uh, while we are working with stakeholders of course next proposal and next funding uh, uh, proposal uh, we implement uh, uh, needs of the stakeholders more precisely I would say so it's all all this communication create to co-creation and mm -hmm. and science which the serve society better than we have done so far. Yeah. Good. Lisa, did you want to add there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a crucial point what Risa said. Co-creation and and you mentioned forest owners and very good because I I see that there would be no change without keeping landowners with, and therefore also in the beginning when we asked where are you from. In this webinar, we didn't ask. Uh, there were no landowners <laughs> because that would be very, very crucial. Also, so that we appreciate their their efforts and uh, they have spent money on that land area and it's about the livelihoods even. And so, so it is very, very important to keep them along. Yeah. That's but co-creation and knowledge sharing, Good. common understanding. Jose, did you want to add there? Or no, I think I fully agree with okay. what my colleagues have suggested. Good. Well, and we should remember landowner structure is very different in different countries, so that might also put a lot of, of uh, add another dimension here. But with that, I really would like to end this panel discussion, which I thought worked super well. Then thank you very much for your your insights and your, your, your thoughts here. Uh, and now we will actually move over into the breakout rooms. Uh, uh, so, but before we before we are are thrown out into into these different rooms, uh, you when you get into one room, we sh we we aim at there will be about five or six people per breakout room. Uh, you should decide on on a note taker, somebody that will put down some basic uh, ideas uh, on on uh, on. Uh, on what you think about this and how you uh, uh, so once you've this decided on an or somebody has agreed to take notes and afterwards you could just email them to elin.varm at slu.s.se which will be put in the chat so you'll find that and then 
third, uh, be ready afterwards with, with uh, uh, if you have a couple of points for the discussion. Uh, uh, so to just speak up uh, or put them in the chat, we will just raise a few points that have brought been brought up, but just keep them very short when you put. So you put them in the chat very, very, very uh, shortly, and then we'll we'll lift those in in uh, uh, in in the afterwards. Okay. So the questions you could see here, uh, you should focus on the three first one. Uh, what are the main soil health challenges in the forest land? Uh, from your perspective, uh, or from a, from across Europe, how can living labs help in improving the soil health challenges? Um, is, and then, what are the main barriers preventing you from attempting the establishment of a living lab? Uh, and what, how do you, how do you see that uh, could be improved? And uh, what would you need in order to help doing that? All right, so. You will now be thrown out into some different groups. Um, uh, I hope you'll stay on for that. Uh, it's a big, good discussion to think about. Okay, uh, so uh, welcome back. Uh, I think that should be more or less it. Um, I want to just say a very few words. Uh, first, if you have something that you want to share with everyone, uh, then then uh, perhaps um, uh, write that in the chat um, and then we can bring that up. But, uh, there were lots of lots nice of discussion in our group, uh, giving specific examples from uh, from uh, North Macedonia, from uh, Italy, from uh, Lit Lithuania, uh, uh, and from other places. But also, uh, I, I, one of the things that was emphasized in our group was uh, that we need really to emphasize the, the ecosystem perspective and the, and the soil, water, atmosphere, biology continuum. And that goes back to what Jose was saying in the, during the panel discussion, that this is, we cannot only look at the soil as, 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 a, as an one entity. We have to really think about it, what it means in, in for, for other ecosystem services as well in order to really understand the usefulness. Uh, now, uh, we only have a very few, a little bit of time left. Uh, now the idea, we move into what we call part four, and that is uh, a matchmaking session for those interested in this. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, you, have, you have one minute uh, to uh, say your name, what organization you work with for, uh, what country you're from, uh, and what area of soil health from a land use perspective you're interested in. All that within one minute. Uh, and, and also, if you're interested in, uh, in, in having others to actually find you and think about the living lab aspects and, uh, and, and soil health issues, uh, put your email address in the chat. Uh, and then we will collect all those those uh, addresses and send and send more information. So, <clears throat> uh, I, I should, will, yeah, Jelmer, I should say yes. this is the key point of the matchmaking session. If um, everyone who's interested in connecting um, to put your contact information, and we can create a mailing list where we can uh, schedule for the meetup or matchmaking event or um, another event for living labs. Um, so please go ahead and add your email address and your name, something yes. that we can find you. Thank you. Right. Um, and you don't really have to talk uh, if you don't want to. Um, uh, you could just write your email address, as, as Tayshree was saying, in the chat. And as so many people have started. Um, uh, and uh, again, if somebody is interested in giving an elevator pitch, uh, please do so, do so. Otherwise, I will just keep talking, uh, and which is fine as well, at least from my perspective. Uh, but uh, there might be in more interest if you speak. Um, so, uh, so um, give us a little bit about your insight into 
here's a chance for a one minute uh, uh, fame. Uh, Ten names so far. Eleven. You can do it. Thirteen. Fourteen. Good. So, Yelmer, I was yeah. also wondering, as there were such big positive response to the people working with living labs, if you can also give a hint of what kind of living labs you're working with. Again, you have the option to raise your hand and say something here or put it in the chat yes. so we know how to organize this later. Hmm? We will leave the matchmaking session open for, for another uh, 10 minutes, so until until uh, eleven fifty-five. Uh, so that's when you have time to write this. Uh, but uh, if you don't want to uh, say anything else about uh, your your um, uh, don't want to take your elevator pitch, that's fine as well. Uh, but uh, I will I will uh, I will then close the. Uh, the uh, uh, spoken part of this and then just leave this chat open for, for another couple of minutes. So with that, uh, colleagues and friends, uh, thank you for joining today. This was, uh, I think, uh, uh, it went well. technically it went quite well. Uh, at least uh, that, that part is, is great. So thank you for your technical support, everyone that helped. Uh, and uh, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Raisa, for your 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 um, your talk. Uh, uh, and thank you, Lisa, Jose, and and Raisa uh, for participating in the panel. That was very useful. And thank you for everyone else as well for participating in this. Um, thank you. And uh, bye bye. My pleasure. Thank you very much.